and welcome to another episode of American Yard Sale. I'm your host, Stephanie Goodman, and today I have a special guest with us. His name is Marshall Moore. Marshall, thank you for letting us be in your home. I have to tell you, I know that there's a story on every one of these corners, and I wish that we had so many episodes to go into it. But tell me about you. Well, I work in the film industry. I'm a... Uh married, <laughs> have uh, six children. Um, I've worked in the film industry my whole life, uh, basically from the time I was 21, and I'm now 40 years later, I'm still, I'm still doing it. Collecting history is the way I look at it, mm-hmm. is, uh, has become very important to me and fun. So you said that you were in the film industry mm-hmm. from a very young age. What, what was your first influence in the film industry and when you started collecting well i first started as an actor (laughs) believe it or not my parents would trot me out to auditions because you know i was a cute kid and they had connections and next thing i know i was getting these auditions for national commercials and so as a four and five and six year old i was getting some of them i was getting getting some jobs on like uh, there's a piece of memorabilia in this room from a commercial i did in 1969 high high c the makers of high c present Dad's big surprise. Oh boy, birthday cake. An ice cold high C. High C's made with real fruit and high in vitamin C. I also did a a Crest commercial, a Georgia Pacific plywood commercial, but I was more interested in what was going on behind the camera than in front of the camera. I was always talking to the crew guys and they were showing me how the camera works and all that. So that was my first, uh, you know initiation to the film industry and then it ended up my career working on film crews as mostly as a location manager so whenever i drink high c i'll remember you yeah yeah i hope so now orange was my favorite but there was also grape and you know you used to have to take the the little uh you know puncture the top and just pour it out of a little triangular hole <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that's what i remember and i actually found one of those recently and uh, and collected it for history <laughs> oh that's so cool yeah. i love that so take us to mm-hmm. um some of your movie memorabilia right well, you know, it didn't dawn on me early in my career enough to like go, oh, you know, I should probably hold on to this and save it. But I did establish a, like a pattern of saving things that are original to the movie. And it's turned out to be a, a good thing. Like the, some of the very first movies I worked on recently, I did. Uh, I spoke in front of a group about the breaking breakdance movies, breaking and breaking two electric boogaloo. Uh, and I brought all my skills you know, shooting schedules, the script, and uh, photos from the set, and everybody's fascinated by it. Mm-hmm. But if I didn't hold on to it, nobody would have been able to uh, see it. And yeah. they're like, hey, this is all real. This is all authentic stuff, you know? So I've, I've held on to it as long as it makes sense uh, to hold on to it. So as I began to work on movies, I, I got a little more creative, like when I worked on Wes Craven's New Nightmare in 1994, I actually asked the wardrobe department uh, for Freddy's fedora that he wore that day on screen, and I got it. And you got and it. And I still have it. Wow. And that same movie also, I was helping clean up at the end of the day, and Freddy's whole prosthetic face was in the garbage in the makeup room. So I pulled it out. That's in this room as well. What's <laughs> left of it, it's all dried out. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, but I had it for years, and our kids would invite their friends over. That's really Freddie's face right Freddy's there. Face. Yeah, yeah. Oh my word, that's so cool. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, I, I try to get some kind of representation of something from each each movie. It's not always possible. Some because some productions are really tight uh, with their stuff. Some sometimes it's just pictures and scripts and you know, gifts that they give us. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. Well, tell me about some of the other movies that you have been involved with and some of the things that you brought home as a keepsake. Yeah, a lot. I mean, a lot of it is is pictures of uh, f- from the set, but mm-hmm. uh, there's one particular movie that I did not work on that I have a great piece of memorabilia, memorabilia from. Okay. Uh, because I've, I've uh, managed uh, and and organized the anniversary events for the Sandlot. Uh, The 20th anniversary, 25th and 30th. But prior to that, um, I acquired, shortly after the filming of the movie, one of the three 
original Babe Ruth balls used in the movie. Oh. Now keep in mind, these aren't signed by Babe Ruth. These okay. are signed by a company called History for Hire. Huh. And they create screen uh, you know, memorabilia to try to mimic things that are of have historical significance. So they created these baseballs for um, you know David Mickey Evans, the writer, director, uh, narrator, for uh, to use in the Sandlot. My ball is I've also uh, kind of screen uh, captured the the images and matched them to my ball. Screen matched the ball to that. So I think it appears twice in the movie: once on the mantle and once in front of the beast when he's contemplating putting it in, in his mouth. Yes. Um, so Rick Bailey was a security officer on uh, this on the Sandlot. And uh, he was charged with, if, if you're familiar with this movie, there's a scene that uh, uh, July 4th, and they hit this ball and it just kind of rolls and comes to a stop and it's at night. Yeah. And the next day, the ball's in the exact same spot where they, where they left it. Right, so he was he was asked to watch the ball all night long and make sure it doesn't move. He's a ball watcher. Yes, and <laughs> and to thank him for that, the prop master Terry Haskell gave him one of the balls, but he didn't know really what to do with it. He was just like, "Oh, this is great. I love it." Sandlot was maybe two years old okay. at the time. My part comes in. I had hired Rick Bailey to do security on Touched by an Angel. And he was so happy that he got the job that he said, hey, I'd like to give you a gift for your kids, basically, you know. And it was this Babe Ruth ball from the Sandlot. Oh. And I brought it home and the kids are like, oh. So I put it on display in the living room. And I've had it since, uh, I've had it since 1996. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's been on display at the state capitol. It was on display there for seven years really? uh, for people to come see in a, fil in a film display now. Now they're asking for it again. Uh, the uh, Museum of uh, Utah Museum of History mm -hmm. is asking for the ball to display in another film thing. So it's pretty rare. But I didn't work on the movie, but I acquired the ball because uh, one, I love the movie, and then two, I ended up being the director of the film commission and then organizing a lot of these Sandlot events. So I kind of feel like I. I know the guys. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Sandlot was actually a small part of my growing up. I was in high school at the time that yeah. they were filming just behind my house. Where? The Wendy Peppercorn. Oh, okay. Yeah. At the pool. Yes. That oh, the famous, Lauren Farr pool. Yes, yeah. that's exactly right. But I can understand how that ball would be significant to you in association to that movie and that story. It's so iconic. And look, anything, anytime you get something screen used that's iconic yeah. is, a, is amazing. And that's really hard to do, mm -hmm. you know, because usually nowadays people save it, sell it, auction it off, yeah. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's rare that you can pick up something that doesn't have a price tag. Yeah.